some integral parts of swimming may seem ridiculous to a spectator. Is there really a reason for wearing swim caps? Wouldn't it be faster to turn around instead of flipping at every end? Why don't they start in the water instead of jumping in? In this video, we will dive into the physics that explain the most efficient techniques in swimming, such as drag, momentum, and torque, and hopefully they won't seem so ridiculous. Before swimmers even get in the water, there are a few steps taken to decrease drag. Drag is the equivalent to friction in water. It is the force that points in the opposite direction of motion, which obviously slows the swimmer down. There are three main types of drag. Pressure drag, which comes from pushing the water. Skin friction drag, which is drag due to the thin layer of water around the swimmer's body. And wave drag, which comes from the surface waves that the swimmer makes as they move. Where do these drag forces come from? Since the water in the pool has mass, according to Newton's first law, when at rest, it will resist motion, a quality called inertia. This means that every time a swimmer makes contact with the water, they have to work against all three types of drag in order to move forward. One way to decrease skin friction drag starts with the construction of the swimsuit. Some are actually nicknamed speed suits because of their ability to decrease drag. These suits are made from a combination of spandex and nylon and are actually water resistant, allowing water to slide across their surface easier than regular swimsuits. Because of this, these suits also shrink when a swimmer gets in the water which hugs the material closer to the swimmer's body and helps make the swimmer's body into the most hydrodynamic shape. A successful hydrodynamic shape is one that best decreases the contact between the water and the swimmer and decreases potential skin friction drag. Although they may look silly, swim caps are more useful than for just identifying the swimmer's team. Swim caps gather hair on the swimmer's head to, you guessed it, decrease drag even more. Although the type of drag this combats is pressure drag, Without a swim cap, hair increases pressure drag by straying away from the point of motion. This gives the water a lot more points of resistance rather than just one. With a swim cap, the potential drag is limited to just the front of the swimmer's head, rather than several points around the head. One last thing may seem stranger yet, flip turns. Many people wonder why swimmers take the time and energy to gauge their distance from the wall, do a somersault, push off the wall, and turn to get back on their stomachs when they can just turn around. Even though it seems counterproductive, all the concerted steps in a flip turn are actually faster than turning around. Not only this, but it can actually increase the swimmer's speed. When the swimmer starts to flip, all their linear motion up to that point is being converted into rotational motion. So the faster they swim to the wall, the faster they can turn and push off. This can be demonstrated by calculating the angular velocity, which is like linear velocity, but occurs when an object is moving in a circular or rotational motion. The formula for angular velocity is the velocity divided by the radius. For example, we can start by assuming a swimmer takes the shape of a circle when tucked in. If the circumference of the swimmer is measured at 4.2 pi when tucked in, and they have an initial linear velocity of 1.8 meters per second, their angular velocity is 1.8 meters per second over 2.1 meters, or 0.86 radians per second. However, if they increase their speed up to 2.2 meters per second, their angular velocity increases to 1.05 radians per second. To go even faster, if they tuck in tighter and decrease their circumference to 3.9 pi, while keeping the 2.2 meters per second speed, their angular velocity is now 1.13 radians per second. The swimmer can increase their speed as they tuck in because the closer their mass is to the axis of rotation, the easier they will turn. Therefore, tucking in as tight as possible will increase the swimmer's speed by using their momentum, whereas just turning around at the wall will stop their momentum. Not only this, but when the swimmer would turn back around, they would have to fight all the pressure and wave drag they just created by swimming towards the wall. Even if these differences are only about a few tenths of a second, it makes a big difference in a long distance race, especially when combined with other efficient techniques. Although it seems logical to just jump in and start swimming, there are countless ways of tweaking a swimmer's speed by improving their techniques. One seemingly obvious but often overlooked technique is breathing. It makes sense that when a swimmer needs to breathe, they should just breathe whenever they need to, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Every time a swimmer breathes, it disrupts their body's momentum. Even a well-trained swimmer has to lift their head slightly to get their mouth above the water which in turn brings their feet down and decreases their speed. This is due to the interactions of the buoyant force and weight of the swimmer. The buoyant force points up, while the weight force, or gravity, points down. 
This means that these forces are considered equal when a swimmer is swimming just at the surface of the water and their body position is even. When a swimmer breathes, the buoyant force on their head increases, so the force of the weight on the other end of their body, their feet, must also increase and therefore their feet sink. One technique that helps this problem is called bilateral breathing. This means the swimmer breathes every three, five, seven, or sometimes even nine strokes. This helps create a rhythm so that the swimmer doesn't suddenly change their body position, as explained previously with the balance of the buoyant and weight forces, which is another way to lose momentum. Another technique that helps this problem is called breathing in the trough, or the pocket. When swimming correctly and efficiently, a swimmer creates consistent waves like a boat or sine or cosine wave function. The bottom part of a wave is actually below the regular water level of the pool. When the lower part of the wave reaches the swimmer, they can actually rotate their head without significantly lifting it to breathe in this pocket of air. Another technique that goes hand in hand with breathing is rotation. On the surface of the water, it appears that swimmers aren't rotating very much, but going underwater may surprise you. Good rotation comes from the core so that the least amount of energy is spent in this motion. You can see this yourself. Try to move your body to the left or right using just your abdomen and without moving your shoulders. Pretty hard, isn't it? Although it may seem obvious in this example, rotation is often neglected in swimming. Rotating from the core makes a smooth stroke and as mentioned before, makes breathing a lot easier. How does this happen? This is explained by Isaac Newton's laws of motion as mentioned earlier. Just like the water has inertia, the swimmer's inertia is moving them forward and keeps them moving. As Newton said in his third law, for every force there is an equal and opposite force. The opposite force to inertia is drag, which obviously slows swimmers down. The key in swimming isn't just to reduce drag, but to find the balance between these two forces. This will be the fastest route through the water. How does this apply to rotation? When a swimmer reaches their arm out to start a stroke and rotate, their whole body turns to reach. The farther a swimmer stretches their arm out, the greater area or volume of water they can potentially push. When they finish the stroke and begin to rotate the other direction, they aren't only pulling with their arm, but also the rest of their body making the turn. This type of force that the swimmer is exerting is called torque, or a force that causes rotation. This is a more powerful force than what can be exerted without rotation, and also gives rise to a greater distance. Since the equation for work is force times distance, a swimmer can do more work, or go faster, when they rotate by using a more powerful force like torque across a greater distance. Let's look at the big picture. Swimming is mostly the stroke, or pull, and the kick working together. Doesn't it make sense just to pull as much water as you can and kick as fast as possible? This actually doesn't work as well as you think. For example, there's a certain sweet spot with the underwater part of the pull. Watch this video to see what I mean. See how the swimmer is stretching her arm all the way out and down? This isn't an awful way to swim, but there is a way that's a lot faster. Now watch this swimmer's arm. See how it bends at the elbow? This is a subtle change, but changing each stroke over a period of a race can make a big difference. How does this work? The position of the second swimmer's arm is bent and closer to the point of motion. If the swimmer keeps their arm completely extended through the pushing motion like the first swimmer, they create a greater torque rather than using it to their advantage. A greater torque on their arm makes the swimmer do more work than they have to in order to complete the motion. The bent arm, or high elbow technique, decreases the amount of torque on the arm, while also decreasing the amount of work a swimmer has to do in order to complete a stroke. In general, the swimmer is finding the balance between getting the biggest volume of water possible and swimming most efficiently. Why do swimmers start up on blocks and dive in rather than just starting in the water? This has a lot to do with getting into the streamlined position mentioned before, but even more to do with speed. This is because of density, which is a measurement of how close together the particles in a fluid are to one another. The density of air is about 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed, while the density of water is almost a thousand times greater at 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. This means that you would have to do more work in water to do the same action in air. 
from what we discussed earlier, every mass has a tendency to resist motion when at rest, or a tendency to keep moving when in motion. Due to its density, water has a greater force of inertia compared to air. Swimmers can take advantage of this by making their first propulsive movement in the air, which makes them do less work to achieve a desired speed before they even hit the water. One last technique that happens underwater that you may not be able to see is called streamlining. Swimmers get into the streamlined position whenever they dive in or push off a wall. Why wouldn't they just start swimming? It seems counterintuitive, but streamlining underwater is actually significantly faster than swimming above water. In fact, it's so much faster that regulations were made to limit the distance a swimmer could travel underwater before breaking the surface. Don't believe me? Watch this video of Dave Berghoff swimming backstroke in the medley relay for the U.S. in 1988. Britain lane 5, West Germany in lane 6, the Netherlands in lane 7, Australia in lane 8. This is the 4x100 medley relay. The four different strokes, the backstroke, the best stroke, the butterfly, and the freestyle. As David Berghoff for the U.S.A. ready to lead it off for the American team. Berghoff blast off lead off. Is the blast off. Polianski stays underwater a long time. Most of the field does. The first four lanes do. Still underwater is David Burkhoff, and when he breaks water and explodes at the top like a Polaris missile, he'll have a slight lead. Indeed Burkhoff he does. comes out swimming on top. Now, what he got hurt last time was that he tried to make up too much distance on a slow start underwater. He ran out of oxygen. Now he came up at a good pace. And he can set a world record in the 100 backstroke if he touches at 54.51 or better. Right now, Burkhoff is under a world record split at the turn. The American extending his lead. It is an even fight for between three swimmers for second at the moment. Igor Polianski might be second. He is swimming for the Soviet Union as David Burkhoff takes it on in. Because of this, in 1989, FINA created the 15-meter rule which means that swimmers must break the surface at or before the 15 meter mark or they will be disqualified. Why is swimming underwater so much faster? Streamlining serves several purposes. First, when finishing a flip turn and coming off the wall, the streamline position brings the swimmer into the most hydrodynamic shape, which both maintains the momentum from the flip turn and most efficiently turns the rotational motion back into linear motion. Streamlining underwater also avoids drag from surface level waves. The motion of the water in the next layer below the surface is a lot less turbulent than the waves of those close to the surface. This is why swimmers try to stay underwater after their dives and flip turns for as long as possible. But because of Dave Burkhoff, they have to spend more time above the water than below. So, using a basic understanding of interacting forces, we have been able to explain all the weird things swimmers do, from swim caps, to flip turns, to streamlining. Even if all these techniques seem silly, together they utilize physics that helps swimmers continue breaking the barriers of what is thought to be humanly possible.